Here we have uh, our main guest of the day, all the way from San Francisco. Warriors traffic, apparently. Warriors traffic, it is definitely. But I brought some Todd? sake for you. Excellent, Todd. Hi. Welcome. What a Hi, treat. Everyone. Hi. I'm Todd. Thanks, Hi. Laura, How are you? our Pleasure. lovely co-host. If okay. you want to come around, we'll get the party going. Oh my god. So it's the Warriors and A's today. And A's. Wow. Crazy out there. So, hey, you're here now. To, I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, our lovely uh, panel today, we have Andrew Vano, Doctor Excellent. of Beverages, Mr. Paul Franson, uh, writer, uh, just wise in the world about food and beverage, and then right. Natalie Vano, doctor's wife. Excellent. Laura Coffer. Excellent. Mr. Pats. Cheers. Well, hopefully some, some sake fans, and uh, I brought some umeshu also, so. Wow. This, Awesome. So some interesting things for, for everyone to taste. Very cool. A couple so. things about Todd Eng. Uh, he uh, has uh, been in, in the beverage uh, world forever. He actually controlled three of the restaurants that uh, some of them are, I'm really fan. Uh, Nihon Lounge in the Mission. Uh, most recently, Corkage. Corkage, sake wine shop, uh -huh. which uh, is uh, closed at the moment, but also uh -huh. part of the restaurant group was Tsunami Sushi. Tsunami Sushi in San Francisco. Yes, so there's and, two uh, Tsunami locations. The most exciting thing about Todd and why I, I extended the invitation to him on the show today was <clears throat> he's starting an important company and uh, he is as excited as people that I've met in the sake world and he's bringing, as you can see, some really cool stuff from Japan, he's on the process and we're really excited about. And not only uh, sake, which mostly Nigata, but offshoots of fun things, making it really accessible and expanding the sake world to other things like mixology and such. Yeah, there's some great possibilities with uh, fruit sakes, uh, especially from Wakayama Prefecture. Uh -huh. um, they have some really wonderful uh, citrus and uh, other fruits. Um, things like yuzu, uh, mikan oranges, <clears throat> which are you know kind of unique to Japan, uh -huh. and uh, they make some wonderful kind of fruit liqueurs. This is their umeshu. They're also awesome. that region. They're famous for their uh, umeboshi, their pickled plums, uh -huh. and their ume. So you know it's Very natural cool. to have ume, umeshu as well. Nice, Todd. You want to tell us a little bit about your background, real quick? Sure. Absolutely. For everybody watching in Australia and New Zealand and yeah, India great. and anywhere else in the world. <laughs> All right. All right. Right, I and love, in Japan. <laughs> I love Australia. I was actually in Australia for a little while myself. Oh, very I, cool. I lived in Melbourne. So nice. I hope there are some, some fans from down under who can you know, see the Southern Cross and absolutely from down there. So um, I've been in the sake uh, world since maybe about 2008. Um, I, uh, before that, I, I worked in the IT industry actually. And uh, I, you know, have, uh, you know, kind of taken to, to uh, sake. I've always been a big. Uh, wine, craft beer fan, uh, and then I discovered sake around the year 2000, uh -huh. and then uh, just got gradually more and more into sake. And uh, you know, I had that you know first moment where I just thought, what is this beverage? What it, you know? Why is it so different from what I had before with sake? What is you know what is going on with this? It's so complex and it's so like refreshing and there's, there's so much interesting flavors, but I, I had no idea that, that sake could be that, those things. Uh -huh. So I started going down the path of learning about it. And, you know, from 2000, early 2000s, not like a whole lot of places in, in San Francisco or the Bay Area where you can drink premium sake, but, you know, they gradually started to become more and more uh -huh. events like uh, Joy of Sake was uh -huh. uh, happened every year where you could have th taste up to 300 sakes. So that was very fun and, and, and eye-opening. I get to meet uh -huh. a lot of uh, sake brewers. And Quite then, an exciting time at that time where everything was starting to bloom in, in terms of, of sake. Yeah, there was, it was just very, very exciting for me to taste uh -huh. you know, a lot of different styles of sake that I had never tried before. Uh -huh. uh, things like Yamaha, which is, tends to be more earthy and more flavorful sakes. Or, um, you know, all the different variety of, of nigori sake that, were, that are out there. I mean, as a lot of people, you know, I think that one of the first sakes that I tried that was different from everything else was maybe a nigori sake, a cloudy sake. Uh -huh. But the ones here are very sweet and tend to be kind of more one note. Whereas if you try uh, nigori sake from Japan, they really run the gamut. They can have a lot of different Take flavors. note of that. Yeah, so. if anybody's trying nigori, maybe try different styles and try to see what... Different styles from Japan, absolutely. Uh -huh. there's, there's a lot of, of, of kind of variety of flavors, more than just sweet. 
out there nice. for Nigori. Yeah. Um, so basically 2007, I, I took uh, John Gautner's professional sake course in Japan. Um, there was like the second year I think he was offering the, the, the course. And so I took uh, his professional sake course, which is geared towards uh -huh. uh, uh, Western or English speaking professionals. Yeah, which Laura and I actually graduated in 2012 from. Oh, right. Yeah. Great, yeah. great. Definitely. Great. We can attest to the, to the quality of fun <laughs> that we had. And Oh, oh knowledge. yeah. Knowledge, yeah. The, the knowledge and, yes. and, and the sake that's consumed. You know, Absolutely. That, it's, uh, it's very eye-opening and, and really interesting, his, his course. He teaches it now in America as well, but in 2007 I took the level one course, 2008 I took the level two course uh -huh. and uh, passed that. And uh, since then I've been working in, in the sake industry, uh, first at Corkage uh -huh. and uh, sort of part-time with uh, the Tsunami Restaurant Group. And then gradually I, I you know, went to... Uh, went to uh, Australia, helped a friend open a, a sake bar at Izakaya in, uh -huh. in Melbourne, and then I came back and I managed Porkage and managed the Tsunami uh, sake program for about three years. So until last year, and then I left the, 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 the time group. to evolve and new challenges. Exactly, exactly. Wow, so very time cool. to, to move on and try new challenges and, and, and bring sake to perhaps a wider awesome. audience. Which one do you want to start with? I'm sure you're thirsty from driving all the way. Yes, exactly. Well, these two from, from Niigata, I think, are, are wonderful, very refreshing ones. Um, <clears throat> so those, yeah. are, those are kind I'll of a good I'll pour them around while you talk about it, Rob, sure. if you like. It's a beautiful label, <clears throat> if you can see that. This one's called uh, Koshi no Tsuru, and uh, it's uh, basically the crane of uh, Koshi, which is uh, the region. Uh, so you see a lot of uh, Koshi no Kanbai, or, you know. <clears throat> different yeah, sakes from Niigata like that are uh, called that. And Niigata is famous for its very sort of light and dry style sake, the Tanre Karakuchi style sake. Um, but I think what's interesting about the region is that even though it's sort of famous for that style of sake, it's it's not all koshi, uh, koshi uh, it's not all uh, dry and light and dry style sake. It definitely can have flavor um, it can have that added dimension. The sake is mostly made from a local rice variety called Koshitande, uh, which is, uh, you know, a lot of uh, really good brewers use wow, this, this, uh, this uh, sake rice, Koshitande. <laughs> Mm. And the, is the style like that in Niigata generally because of the food or because of the water or because of the culture? Or like what, what, what drives a stylistic, you know, decision in, in a region? I, you know, that's an interesting question. And I think that, that part of that, it does have to do with the drinking culture in the region. Like there are certain regions where they prefer uh, light and dry style sake because it's easier to drink okay. and easier to consume a lot of. Like I've, I've specifically heard in Kochi Prefecture where they say, oh, you know, we're the number one sake consuming region in Japan. And so we like sake that's very, very easy drinking, nomiyasui, very easy drinking sake. It's kind of like Pilsner beer where you can drink a lot of Pilsner. Mm -hmm. So if you're, you know, want that kind of sake, then you want you want to brew a, a light and dry style, easy drinking style. Nothing uh -huh. with too much drink flavor. more. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It's kind fresh. of more. Yeah, you can consume more. It's like easier on the palate. Uh huh. Um, so that being said, I also think that there is a commercial aspect to it, where you know Niigata became famous for uh, the style, the style. So they, and so brewers decided that they kind of have to fit into that style. And so I've talked to a lot of people in Niigata, and, you know, it's not universal uh -huh. that they love that style yeah. of sake, because a lot of them feel like... Oh, but that's what they're known for, and they still we stick have to true. Do. Exactly. Totally. Exactly. Right. So, you know, there's a bit of, you know, both things going on. There's a commercial aspect that's, that's really like the, the identity of the region. Um, but, you know, it's also just very popular. It's delicious. Mm. Very nice. What do you guys think? Good, huh? It's really uh, approachable, cleansing. I like the weight on it. It's pretty, it's really fun. Like it had a bigger finish than, uh, than the wakataka that we just tasted. Just, like, really nice finish. Oh, excellent. It's got that herbal, that kind of licorice, anise. There is that. That like, me almost, mentho almost menthol flavor. The last one we had had so much fruit on it. This is... You've had the wakataka before, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with it. So yeah, very, very more delicate and more layered into the, the herbs. Mm -hmm. Here, if you want, 
So I have so a little bit? So much of this one, but this one's called Koshino Karoku. Also Nigata? Also Nigata, from a very small brewery, Kondo Brewery. And um, <clears throat> this sake is very famous for being a great match for shellfish. Uh -huh. And uh, because of its sort of, uh, I'd say dry qualities, but also well-balanced uh, flavor, I'd say that it's, I'd say that it's very good with uh, with shellfish uh -huh. in particular, and and it became very well known for uh, you know pairing with with uh, with shellfish. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, you said a daiginjo. This one's actually jumai ginjo. Jumai ginjo. Just like nice. the other one is also jumai ginjo. Uh -huh. um, and sure. the name for it means um, a sixth sense. Uh -huh. uh, which I think is a great name. It's it's it sort of refers to um, the deer in that region, uh -huh. which apparently have <clears throat> a bit of a sixth sense. Uh -huh. So I think it's an in, uh, uh, interesting uh, name for this sake, meaning different, sixth huh? Sense. Yeah. yeah, that's it has nice. like almost like a bubble gum. -y, like the, there's like this sweetness to it on the nose. It's dry. And this is the same region, same prefecture. Or? Same region. It's a little more kind of coastal. Um, the other sake brewery is maybe a little bit more in the mountains. And one of the interesting things about the first brewery I should mention is that they, they have their own uh, rice milling machine at the, at the brewery. Uh, which which not means a that common thing, yeah. Not, not very common. A rice mills are a very expensive piece of equipment and you, know, you only use it you know, part of the, the, the brewing season. But um, you know, bre breweries that you know, want to control that a uh, particular part of the process very much, or they maybe want to uh, mill the rice very fine, uh, then, you know, in this case, they decided to buy their own mill and invest in, in kind of working, you know, to have full control. To have full control. Uh -huh. Exactly. So they, they explained to me, they showed me the, the rice mill, and, and they said, oh, for their daikin josake, which I, I tasted, but unfortunately it isn't, it isn't available. Um, to purchase at, at all, actually, <laughs> it it, uh, they, it takes like three days to, to mill the rice down to wow. the the samai wow. buai that they use to, to, to make that sake rice. So it's very labor intensive. It's very time and energy intensive process. And similar strain of rice. Yeah, I think that that's, that one is the, the koshitanre as well. Very cool. So um, and then this, if I don't recall wrong, this is uh, California, right? That, that is. I brought a couple things from uh, from uh, uh, my friend over at uh, uh, Sequoia Sake. Uh -huh. uh, Jake is uh, brewing sake here in San Francisco Very now, cool. and it's it's kind of cool to uh, see his his product evolve and and uh, and change. He's only been brewing excited. sake for about a year now, so. You have a wow. Yes. Oh. Actually, thank you. Same right here. Oh, perfect. For a second. And uh, this one's a nama. You want to explain to our guest what nama means, real quick, in a few words, in your own take? Sure. Uh, namas uh, uh, are basically unpasteurized sakes. Uh, the process of pasteurization with sake is is a, a, you know a process that they've been uh, they've used since actually before Louis Pasteur was born. Um, to uh, heat the sake and uh, then cool it and then keep it, it that helps it helps make it shelf stable and uh, in Japan which is very hot for most of the you know summer months when uh, the sake has been pasteurized they found that it really maintains its flavor and its color and its uh, sort of qualities good qualities uh, much better in those sort of pre-refrigeration days so Pasteurization has been done with sake, and for most sake, it's it's been pasteurized two times. Um, sake is usually pasteurized after the brewing process, so right after it's kind of finished brewing, they, they'll pasteurize it, and then they'll store it for a few months, and then when they're ready to ship, they usually pasteurize a second time. So a lot of sakes that you've tried here in America from Japan will be pasteurized um, either twice or at least one time. Um, it's not very common to get true nama. And what I mean by true nama, and this is where it gets a little confusing is, because there's a process by which they, they pasteurize twice, sometimes they'll label uh, sakes in Japan as you know, pasteurized one time. Uh -huh. And those are also either namazume or namachozo. Uh -huh. uh, so depending on which 
pasteurization they skip, they'll call the sake namachozo or namazume. And then a lot of times that information gets put on the package and just kind of shortened. And they're like, oh, well, it's nama. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's not nama. It's nama chozo or nama zume, and it's pasteurized one time, uh -huh. which makes a big difference in the totally. flavor. This is true nama. In other words, it's never been pasteurized, never wow. been heat treated. It so tastes different than all of it. Totally, it's, it's full of life. It's like rich and absolutely. Yeah, it's hard to really relay this to all the, the uh, viewers right now, or people that will see it eventually. But unless you go and pick up a bottle and try it, and it depends on the on the brewery, and depends on is it California, is it Japan, but it, it is it is impressive. For instance, um, Sekio, I'm a big fan of Sekio, and there's the two. There's the uh, the Raider Jumai Ginjo, and there's the Nama, which comes out uh, every spring. Mm -hmm. And when you have a chance, there is a chance you'll find them at a restaurant or a store. They are making a little more and more available in the U.S. every time. And if you do, try it side by side because there is nothing like it. Eh? The texture, richness, right? Yeah, it's really light, uh, you know, like night and day. Uh -huh. Really, the difference between an unpasteurized sake and a pasteurized one. Now, I, I hesitate to say one is better than the other. I would say that Nama, because of its qualities, yeah. it's, it's not as uh, stable. It uh -huh. definitely will change and evolve uh, over time. It. Um, it doesn't uh, stay fresh as, as, as long. So you really want to kind of consume these typically. Uh, Somewhat fun before it goes before. When was this bottle? Yochi. I think, uh, I think Jake was just, just bottled this recently. Uh, so this is, this is like, you know, a matter of uh, weeks and or maybe a month or so. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Alcohol level on this one? It's about 15, 16 percent. Um, this is their Nama. 14.5 for the Nama. 14.5. Yeah. So that's even lower than uh, most of the sake out there. Yeah, most sake tends to be 15 to 16 percent. We do see some sakes that are labeled as Genshu, and Genshu sakes are full strength, sakes that haven't been diluted. And so they typically will be like 17, 18, even up to 20 percent alcohol for Genshu sakes. And, and sake is the, the highest naturally occurring uh, alcohol content uh, beverage. Without diluting. Yeah. Without dilute, without uh, distillation. Yeah, so, you know, naturally sake can get up to, I've seen Genshu sake is up to 21% alcohol, very, you know, Oh yeah. <laughs> gripping the, sake. There's uh, the Naruto Tainama Genshu, for instance. <laughs> yes, that, that one's a, a strong one, and uh, yeah, they, they definitely is. Yeah. Totally. That'll grow some, uh, some hair chest <laughs> exactly. as you drink it. And then let's get into the fun stuff. I, I'm actually truly excited. I'm a purist when it comes to the beverage world and most of it that know me, wine and beverage, spirits and stuff. However, I am really, really excited to try something off the wall other than Nigori, all the fruit stuff that we've been talking about. Excellent. And I'm thrilled. Let's see. Yeah. Without further ado. So this one is, uh, like I said, Umeshu from uh, Wakayama Prefecture. Uh -huh. uh, Minakata or uh, Sekyai, Sek, uh, Sekyo Itai is uh, the uh, brewery name, and uh, this is uh, Umeshu from, from that region. Um, so sort of made like a, they make limoncello. Uh, they just use the... This is very exciting. I mean, it's just mouth-watering. You can drink this as an aperitif, or uh, after dinner, or mix it. And I've, I've had a few uh, Umeshus but I, I feel like the ones I've had before are the ones more widely commercially available, like Choya, which Choya. nothing wrong with them. But you can taste the difference in the craft that goes into into a product like this. It's yeah. it's just leaner, more acid. Exactly. Ooh, fun. It's good balance to this. Good sort of uh, mouth watering acidity to it, and uh, you can just drink it neat, and it's it's beautiful. Or you can have it with uh, crushed ice mm -hmm. and uh, make a or over a ice cream. Thank yeah. you. Ume, like raw. I mean, there, I always see them in a Usually beverage pickled. or a pickle. Yeah, or, salted I mean, and pickled. Mm -hmm. There's something done to it. Like, mm -hmm. In Japan, is it eaten raw? Just we slice up an ume and no, not huh? really. I think no. it's inedible. It's like. I Right, it's like, like too much acid and too to green. It's a really tart. I think tart so, fruit? and then, and when they they pick them, they usually pick them quite uh, green to make for the uh, the the meshu. Um, but uh, you know, I, I don't really know. It's never been served all to you. The, exactly, I've only seen it as 
uh, the pickled plum, umeboshi, uh, mm -hmm. or in this case, uh, umeshu. And sometimes it's, it's aged, actually, as well. You'll see some umeshu that are they're aged, and, and it can be a, a totally different experience. Uh -huh. You know, you get a lot more complexity in the, uh -huh. the flavor, and it mellows out. Totally. So I think that... I would love for the audience and for all of us to try uh, one of these hamachi tacos with this. I think it just would be a very fun, balanced pairing. I'll hand you one of these. And uh, please help yourself. This is uh, hamachi sashimi with yuzu koshu and a little guacamole and pretty playful. You've seen it before. It's just exciting. Oh, it's awesome. <laughs> and I think this... This, I've never tried a Wurume show, but I'm really curious to see uh, how it would work. Thank you. Proper weapons, you're welcome. And it's not like a liqueur where it's, it's, the alcohol is really hot, right? This is, this is 12%. So. They make a, a, a variety of uh, fruit liqueurs that are usually between 8 and uh, 12%. So uh, they're, they're strong enough that they can... Uh, be used as as a mixing ingredient. Yeah. Um, and they're they're not uh, you know they're they're strong enough, they'll but they're they're not uh, they're not as strong as sake or wine. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. How soon uh, do you think we can start seeing these products? I know you're still in process, but if you were to throw a dart, um, I'm hoping that it's either later this summer or early in the fall. Beautiful. So, so no pass this year. If it's yeah, up, this year is, we're gonna go. we should we should be seeing these products and nice. hopefully some other ones mm -hmm. uh, coming from, from my company Sake Brothers uh -huh. is the name of it. Take so. note of Sake Brothers, and I'll definitely keep you updated throughout the shows, and we'll probably have Todd back to celebrate when he's when he's in the market. Yeah, so. yeah, I'd yeah. Be, but these are back. really fun. Have, like a full range of the products that we'll have from Niigata and mm -hmm. from other regions. Wakayama and Tokyo Prefecture. Uh -huh. I'm looking at some other ones as well from Fukushima and uh, down cool. in Fukuoka and Kyushu as well. So there's just, nice. uh, just there's around so many kind of interesting regions kind of for, for sake. Um, Niigata is like, uh, it's, you know, one very famous region, and a lot of people, uh, you know, recognize that as this sort of a region for, uh, you know, for uh, premium sake, for premium sake, and uh, you know, good quality sake. But at the same time, I think that you know they brew sake in every single region in Japan. Every single prefecture brews some sake, and uh, there is interesting sake in just about every region. So, what do you think of the pairing? I think it's great. Oh man, I love it. That works, huh? Yeah, it's spicy. The acid and the spice. Yeah, it's the spicy in that. Well, let's try the last one. Okay. Looks very fun. Definitely on the thicker style of Nigori, I would say, from the looks of it. Wow. Yes, Look at it that, is. baby. This will be a good example of a sake that is like a meal. This is <laughs> something called doburoku. And uh, doburoku is a, like a, like a porridge style of Nigori. And, um, this is definitely on one end of the extreme Look at that. as far as uh, Nigori goes. And this sake wow. is from a, a little region. Um, hmm? Yes. Like yeah. A spoon is like a. Yeah. It's like a porridge, really. It really is. Um, did Nigori come? But was it the was it the precursor or was is this an after? Is it a, like sake? Was it always a little cloudy, or is it now cloudy because it's... You know, as a commercial product, uh, sake has been uh, clear, like commercial sake, seishu, legal sake is always clear, mm -hmm. but um, this kind of, uh, <laughs> this style of sake has always been made sort of at home. Like if there's homebrew sake or like country style, rough style sake, it's like, the, like this. Like the moonshine? Exactly. And so Nigori became like a, a popular um, commercial style, I think in the 70s, and uh, didn't, you know, necessarily take off, but it was, it was a product that um, the brewers were, you know, had fun making and they enjoyed drinking this. It's like, you know, it's rich and it's, it's hearty yeah. and it, it's kind of rough you know, um, but they weren't really allowed to make it as a commercial product uh -huh. because of the rules which stipulated that 
uh, sake had to be filtered. Yes. And so, so, you know, sake, you know, legally has to be filtered and then, and then you know, reintroduced. Yeah. So they were like, how do we get around this rule? And it's very interesting, I think, the way that they've got around this rule is that, you know, they do filter this sake. They just coarsely filter it. Right. <laughs> Someone just holding okay. their yeah. hands out like this. <laughs> and then it's okay. It's filtered. Well, of what? Horchata, horchata absolutely. Horchata, yeah. This is the ultimate like horchata like. And there's a, almost a little bit of like effervescence in there, like yeah. like CO2 that's trapped in the rice. There often is yeah. in, in nigori, and then this one is a nama nigori that, that a friend brought from uh, this uh, region in uh, Fukushima called Aizu. Mm. And uh, it's definitely, a, you know, I, I love it. You don't see this kind of sake no. anywhere, <laughs> basically. It's, mm -hmm. You can only yeah. get it. Uh, from Japan, and it usually stays in that region because of the nature of it. It's I think not really it's gonna... one of the priceless things about this show. We're gonna do a slow mo of all the panel <laughs> after they tasted the sake, and it was pretty exciting. I don't know if you guys it's missed it, but face. yeah, that, that was like wow. I was like having uh, Mexican candies for the first time or something like that. Do you think you could, do you think you could serve this in here? Like, Absolutely. People would people be receptive? Oh, yeah. yeah. People love Nigori, and if you push the envelope, I mean, I think the ones I have, I have Rihaku, which is like lower lease, a little more barnyardy, and then I have Toza and Nigori, which is like the most crowd pleaser. But this would be like the other side of the spectrum where, hey, try it, give it a go, and some people are gonna love it, some others are gonna, have one glass and then move on. Exactly. <laughs> but it's it's exciting, really, yeah. really and fun. What I like about this type of nigori is that um, you can really show that you know it it's, can be something different than most people expect nigori to be, which is sweet and kind of lighter. Um, but this one Chef. is rich and it's like a like a meal. Yeah. And with that, uh, give me one second. I'm going to show it the Chef Miller here. He needs to try that. With that, I, I'm really grateful that uh, to have a, such a fun panel today, good friends, to have taught all the way, battling the traffic and probably no running over no the worries. middle of the road. And <laughs> good thing you brought the huge Hummer with the big wheels. And uh, you're here, yeah. and you brought some amazing stuff to share. I'm glad to have you. Uh, thank you all, thank you to my co-host. And uh, thank you everybody, Zeus and Didier. And it was such a fun show. And until next time, come by guys. Thank come you. Bye. Cheers.